Yes, no, maybe. Okay. Let's continue with Sebastian Pequen, Naomi Murani, security incident response experts at Honeywell, and today they will tell us how to hunt for APTS in ICS environments. Enjoy. Thank you. I will start with a little announcement. Uh, my colleague that I had to present with, unfortunately, could not join us today, but uh, he will be uh, replaced by my other colleague, Claudio, which I think will do a great, great job. Uh, let's start uh, to, uh, to see a little bit of context about ourselves. Uh, my name is Sebastian Petru. I'm a listener response security expert at Honeywell, which comes with three uh, years' experience and I have behind him. I'm also a power engineer and I have a master's degree in technical hydraulics and power engineering. I've also added some certifications here for many reasons. I'm about to give the word to my colleague here. Hello everyone. My name is Claudio. I'm a security consultant with uh, roughly seven years experience in uh, cybersecurity. Uh, I won't brag of my uh, certifications. Um, today, we will talk about industrial control systems, short ICS. Um, why? Because um, recently the world started to shift uh, its focus on them, on their protection actually. So I have to make a big fuss about it. Um, well, industrial is a big word, and by right, it is something uh, that brings great concern amongst, uh, you know, engineers as well as uh, entrepreneurs. And let's start with what is actually uh, an industrial control system. As we look from the outside, it's mainly big platforms uh, from uh, oil and gas refineries um, to power, electrical power grid, waste ma wastewater management, um, actually everything that um, produces something in the physical world. Um, that's just on the outside. On the inside, um, the ones that actually work in those environments see a whole other, uh, uh, let's say, picture. And it looks like this. Um, if we go, let's say, up in the levels, just like Windows separates the important uh, assets in their active forest, uh, this is a similar approach to somehow um, better uh, create policies and security measures for them. <clears throat> and if we go from level zero up, Actually, the most important part comes from the bottom to the top, just like in Windows, right? And we have a level zero, which are your mechanical parts that wrap up, wrap up your chocolate and um, make up a symbol of car. We have also um, sensors, temperature sensors, Lecture sensors, we have the mechanical valves, you know, everything that actually creates some physical actions in the process. But that's the physical layout, and the most advanced uh, <clears throat> layout comes after them. The ones that make sure that the physical components move synchronized and complete a certain process which uh, an established uh, platform behind them. 
So in level one, we have the controllers, the parts, the FTUs, everything that is like a small computer, which guides the mechanical parts in their job. But the thing is, although these devices from level zero and level one are maybe independent of the rest, they have some, some sort of like a loop, they, are, they can be controlled and monitored by the upper lens, where that's mainly the most vulnerable parts when it comes to security, because they are, um, let's say, controlled by humans. So, from level two and up, we have the human interaction from the engineers that configure the load devices and the operators that make sure that monitor the process, the, the whole overall process, and somehow they also, when an hour disappear, can interact with the process itself. And after that, of course, you will know and maybe you find some, some similarities between an enterprise environment and this one, the ICT. Because we have your typical DFZ and your typical uh, management, management uh, level. Now, why the, why the focus on these violence? Well, let's say it all started uh, in just a mechanical map, okay? Steam and everything that doesn't have anything related to internet protocols and, you know, IT stuff. But in the 2000s, they said, well, I would like, as a manager, to see how everything goes and rolls out from my bureau, right? And somehow the IT staff and the experts said, we can do that, sure. Let's build some Ethernet ports in the control devices and you can see what they are doing. And so somehow standard protocols appeared to be used more frequently in all these industries. Now, that's a good part because some of them quite, uh, had quite a profit from this. You know, because they took the process, the deliverables, the, uh, the end product uh, management and production. So, yeah, we can understand that. But then, this happened. Let's say that um, the impact that these uh, campaigns uh, had on them counted roughly over 100 million dollars in losses. And if we count the losses, it's just um, not, not everything that comes to mind, right? Um, it's just uh, material losses, system failure and damage, even uh, human life loss, and that's a big issue for them. Um, but the thing is that after all this, they started to question their approach in mixing IP and industrial control systems. And like everyone that uh, has a business with uh, a fingerprint of IT behind it, they all start to ask themselves some questions. And, you know, it's good to be paranoid and ask yourself where will I get striked as well. Now, um, everything is soft, right? From malware to, so to applications to the very thing that is behind the control devices. And something uh, like a pattern is behind all of them, right? 
So the security community started to analyze the campaigns and they all started to see some similarities between the campaigns in the enterprise environments. And they started with the attack vectors. I don't know if you can see this, but we have a sweet injection, <coughs> brute force, weak authentication policies, right? So it's something similar to what we've seen before in enterprise environments. Now, where does this lead us? The, the, the absence of good practices. That's the main thing. Because um, even the good pentesters recommend you must have at least best practices implemented. And because the industrial control systems recently surfaced in uh, all the cybersecurity domain, of course, they started with uh, just a um, concern for, for fast responses and uh, you know, fast processes. They didn't actually pay any attention to additional software, additional devices, IDS, IPSs, antiviruses, and something that would consume their uh, CPU power and uh, bandwidth, you know. But, you know, aside those attack vectors that we all know, there was a big part that you know, somehow they didn't quite knew what happened. How did they get in and what did they do? Just the fire consequences. You know, a machine broke, a fire appeared, something like that. And as we talk about best practices, the most important one for these responders, at least, is logging. That is why some uh, security experts say, wow, I see it. Mm. It's really tough to defend them. Because, let me tell you what, if you have a steady process that makes a good product and you have a um, continuous profit for uh, you know, selling and producing, you don't want to mess with that. So, it's a basic rule. If something works, you don't mess with it, right? But, and if someone like me shows up and say, well, you know, you don't have, like, you have a, a default rule password that needs to be changed, and, yeah, but the, the, the entrepreneur would say to me, you know, I, I'm quite reluctant to let you do some modifications, and so I'll pass. Uh, any other question? Any other idea you have? Uh, no, it's the most basic one. And that is the main problem with protecting these uh, environments. It's not quite easy to do to that. To that. So um, you actually need good experts in uh, your environment that know what you are using in level one and level zero. Because one aspect to be uh, of concern here is that they are very old. Some of them stupidly old. And I don't think if any, anyone is capable enough to even stand because they're in their age. And somehow none of the vendors give any for the support for them. So a good other recommendation would be to update your devices. Now, um, just so that we have more practical, practical explanation of uh, this idea, of uh, this approach, we prepared for you a small uh, on hands example demo. And I will let my colleague Sebastian to take it from over here. Thank you, Claudio. Okay, so before we go to the practical application, we need to first explain a case study with 
decided to choose black energy because uh, it's a staple for the ICS uh, uh, threat map and uh, it uh, is the first uh, incident that was publicly acknowledged by the, gov by the Ukrainian government to lead to uh, financial losses and uh, to customer uh, and to customer power outages. Uh, this is a very uh, important case because, uh, as you know, uh, the energy sector, along with the education and the public uh, health sector, are one of the is one of the three uh, essential essential pillars that guides the. Uh, the stability of a country. Uh, this, this was a very complex attack. Uh, the APT group uh, demonstrated a variety of tools and tactics and they targeted three separate uh, energy distribution companies and they compromised them at the same time. So, in order for the attackers to do their malicious intent, they needed to uh, have some uh, conditions in place. In this case, they struck a call line because uh, after they did their initial uh, compromise, they soon uh, figured out that the VPN that was used by the three companies to log into the business network lacked two-factor authentication. Uh, they did not have a rule in place in order to prevent remote connections out of the environment by utilizing uh, remote uh, access capabilities that are native in the environment. And uh, the ICS environment was not monitored for abnormalities and uh, threat indicators. If you couple the above conditions with the public, publicly available information of the vendors that provided the RTUs and uh, the PLCs used in the attack. Uh, <coughs> this, gave the, this gave the attackers all the tools necessary to wreak havoc. So, we are going to map the attack on the uh, cyber kill chain. <coughs> Unfortunately for ICS applications, uh, the traditional cyber kill chain developed by Lockheed Martin is not enough, so a second stage had to be added where uh, the attackers need to develop custom malicious firmware or malicious software that will then be tested on their networks, which will then be delivered to the target network, and then it will be installed and modified, and only after that the ICS attack per se is going to be implemented. We're going to start with stage one. We have reconnaissance. As, as far as we researched, there, is, uh, there are no reports showing that uh, reconnaissance was performed. But given the fact that the attack was complex, the, the attackers had to compromise three different uh, companies. It is implied that heavy, that heavy reconnaissance was done prior. Next, we have the weaponization step. The attacker carefully crafted malicious documents, or documents, that were then <coughs> that, that were then delivered via spear phishing to IT personnel and uh, administrative users that upon upon the opening and enabling macro uh, the macro functionality black energy tree will be would be installed on the systems. Next, we're going to go to the command and control the C two step. Upon the upon the installation step. Uh, the malicious uh, the file that was installed uh, contacted several external IPs that uh, enabled communication back and forth to the IT environment. <coughs> After gaining the initial foothold and establishing the situ, situ channels, uh, the, one of the first actions that were performed by the attackers was to uh, harvest credentials, escalate privileges, and then start to move laterally throughout the environment. It was not uh, long before they figured out how to access the ICS environment, and uh, then they jumped to the stage two of the attack. So, in stage two, we have the development phase. 
Uh, again, there is no forensic evidence to prove this, but uh, uh, judging from the MO of the attackers, uh, the development phase had two steps. We have step one, where they uh, figured out how to interact and uh, manipulate the disaster uh, management system in the environment, and step two, where they, they developed a malicious version of the, fr uh, of the firmware used for the uh, devices that enable communication from serial to Ethernet. Next, we have the testing phase. Well, <coughs> it is possible that they develop, that they launch the attack without testing it uh, prior. It is highly unlikely. Uh, so, most likely, they used their, uh, their own networks in order to test the, the malicious firmware. Next, we are going to uh, analyze the delivery step. During, during the ICS uh, attack, the malicious actors used uh, uh, the available uh, the, the, the available native software that was used by the engineers in order to uh, to deploy the uh, the the firmware to the devices. Next, we have the installation. The step was performed by effectively installing the software. And uh, one of the final steps of this attack was to uh, eventually lock the engineers out of their own workstations and uh, uh, begin to execute the ACS attack. Uh, the final step of the attack was simply using the HMIs in the SCADA environment uh, by opening all the breakers that control the power, retaking it offline across all three targeted uh, companies. And last but not least, the, the malicious firmware developed by the attackers had an additional building functionality that prevented the execution of remote commands on the serial to Ethernet devices, preventing the attackers, the, the defenders, to uh, remote, remotely command the breakers and put on the power grid, even though they eventually got in, uh, got their hands back on their own equipment. Now let's jump to the practical application. Okay, so uh, I presume that there are no power engineers in the in the audience, so I'm going to give a little bit of context about the HMI that we're using here. So basically, this is a single line diagram that engineers in power distribution system, uh, companies or uh, systems use in order to track the power output and to remotely command the uh, equipment that are that are on field. So. We have the, you can see that, uh, you, you can see the blue squares, those are the circuit breakers. Those are basically the devices that uh, turn the power on and off in the environment. Next you can see we have some transformers there, we have some separators, and you can see the, <coughs> in the bottom side of the, uh, of the diagram, you can see the power output for the, uh, <coughs> for the consumers. I'm going to ask you to focus on the two uh, breakers that have alternating colors and basically their power outputs. You can see that we have 10.7 megawatts here and also I think it's 6.9 megawatts there. Let's see what happens if, uh, if an engineer uh, mistakenly or unknowingly opens uh, <coughs> a Word document that was uh, somehow delivered to him. It could have been via spear phishing, uh, having the, uh, the enterprise uh, environment compromised before, or via a USB device that was planting on him, and so on. <coughs> oh. 
Okay, so I've, so I've executed the, the, the payload. Right now, we can see that uh, the, uh, the single line diagram in the HMI is going to start to behave erratically. We can see that some color change, colors change, and uh, shortly, you will probably see that the uh, two breakers that I've asked you to, to pay attention to suddenly become open. And also, the power distribution drop to zero megawatts. Right now, the consumers don't have any power in their systems. If I would have been uh, an engineer, I would probably start, uh, I would probably think that this is a faulty equipment and start to command the breakers to close. Okay, so now we should get power back on here. We should try to do the same to this breaker as well. But the attackers carefully crafted their payload in order to interfere with this as well. You can see that the breakers are now opening again. Probably this process will uh, repeat itself because the engineer will probably, most likely, start to uh, turn the power back on again and hopefully, eventually, he will figure out that there is something wrong and he will contact the security operations center that is in charge of monitoring this environment. Now let's change the view to the security operations center. Just a second now. Okay, so to give you a little bit of context, we are, we are we have installed syslog on the sysmon on the workstations, and we are monitoring Windows events, basic stuff that is not too intrusive to the ACS environment. We are using a SIEM solution. In our case, we've decided to use Plump, but it can also be done with uh, Kibana or L and L LK. But uh, this is the least important part, the tool we are using. Uh, let's presume that uh, the attacker phoned us and told us that the uh, that the HMI started to behave erratically, I don't know, let's say 15 minutes ago or something. Now let's uh, uh, craft a query here. Because time is crucial here, we don't have time to look at all the processes on the workstation. So we're going to filter on the rarest processes that are found on the uh, on the developers, on the engineers' workstation. Okay, so we can see uh, our query uh, brought us on the screen an Excel.exe process, which we might want to look at, a PowerShell.exe process, also, let me see, okay, the problem, this is the web server for, this is the web interface for the server. Okay, let's take a look at the PowerShell. You can see right here that uh, the attack, that the PowerShell is running uh, an encoded command that is hidden from the user. So this is the usual stuff you're, you're going to see in a malicious attack. Let's, uh, uh, let's see what happened next because, okay, we've, uh, we've reached the conclusion that, that we're, we're under attack. Let's see how, the, how did the, attackers managed to 
compromise that workstation. For that, we uh, for that the process tree would help us greatly here. But because we don't have the necessary tools to look at the process tree, we don't have an EDR on the workstation, we are going to have to improvise. So we developed a Python script that is going to build us the process tree uh, using the scene, uh, scene queries. For that, we're going to need the process view ID. Let me find it right here, this one. Let's copy that for a little bit and move to our terminal here. Okay, so let's execute the script which will have the input of the process UID that we've previously copied. So basically what the script does, it takes the input of the process UID and uh, does some successive queries in order to build us a final query that will give us the process tree of the entire chain of actions. Uh, okay, so it, uh, ended, it uh, gave us some results. The results are stored in, a, in another CSV file, so let's take a look at it. So you can see here the created process tree. Let's copy this and uh, paste it into our scene. Hopefully I can select it all. Let's get back to to our scene. Not this one. Okay. Let's take a while for the query to return some events. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, I know what the, the issue is. I have a. Let's take a look at the episode. Uh, just a second, please. It appears that the demo gods are not uh, helping me today. Ah, okay. Okay, so it works now. Thank you very much. Okay, so we can now see from bottom to top that uh, we have the winlock.txt process, the user init process, and the explorer.txt process. This is uh, basic Windows functionality. When Windows starts, you will see this chain of processes. But next, you're going to see an excel.txt file that, <coughs> that is spawning a PowerShell file. And knowing that uh, it was spawned from explorer.txt, this uh, implies user interaction. So most likely, we've, uh, there, there's some social engineering above. <coughs> and uh, probably the user needs some uh, awareness training. Next, the next step would be to uh, search for persistence because uh, you know attackers need to establish the foothold on the environment. 
So to do that, we're going to build a basic query. It's very simple. We're going to search for event code 4663, which is the registry audit event code in Windows, or event code 4698, which is the scheduled task uh, <coughs> Windows event log. And just to be sure, we're going to add event code 11 from Sysmon, which is that a new file was dropped on the system. Let's uh, increase the time period a little bit because uh, maybe the last 15 minutes passed. So right now we can see that uh, some events are returned. Let's take a look at uh, this one, for example. It's spawned by Excel, so it might uh, uh, have relevance to our investigation. Taking a look at this and scrolling to the, uh, to the log in order to see a better view, we can see that uh, the malicious Excel file uh, dropped a bad file at startup. You can see it right here at, at here or, or here. Okay, so now we've detected uh, persistence as well. The next step would be to kick the attacker out. In order to do that, unfortunately, the ICS environment is a little bit more sensitive than the network environment. So. Uh, Typical solutions that would help with this, such as process disruption or EDR or even common uh, AV files, would be uh, a little hard to implement in our in, in this kind of environments. So, so the what we recommend would be to use uh, some sort of whitelisting solution and uh, okay, some sort of uh, whitelisting solution and uh, actually blacklist all the uh, TTPs that we found here. Also block the C2 domains, if there are any, at the border uh, uh, firewalls, and so on. Now let's get back to, the, uh, to our presentation. Okay, so we've uh, seen how to detect such uh, attacks. Let's jump to the conclusions. Uh, the main conclusion that we can draw today is that relying on the uh, premise that the ICS environments are not connected to the internet and, with the, and which translates to they are secured is deeply flawed. Uh, monitoring needs to be performed in the ICS environment as well. Also, uh, uh, it, we need to take into consideration that uh, power engineers in working in plants and industrial environments need some awareness training on uh, on this uh, on this kind of uh, uh, threats that they have, they could face. Also, another important step is that the SOC engineers that and the analysts that work. Uh, closely with the industrial side of the of the production, also need uh, <coughs> need training in order to better understand how the industrial environments work, and uh, in order to not disrupt the process in any case. And this con this concludes our presentations, and uh, we have some Q and A's. Presentation. I have a couple of questions. Sure. So, from your experience, I'm not sure if you ever had an incident. 
how fast will it take for you to realize that they changed the corner on one of your switches, let's say, power switches? And the second question would be, uh, what's your response to that? I mean, do you have backups to your formulas? <coughs> do you have backups for your formulas? Or uh, how do you... Okay, it's that. So, uh, to answer your first question, it's uh, pretty hard to detect uh, such attacks. Usually, there, in practice, we will be using a reactive approach. We will see that, just like I've uh, uh, presented you here, we will see that uh, the uh, devices start to act faulty, and then we will start to investigate. Uh, however, judging on the uh, the uh, importance of that uh, <coughs> on, uh, of that attack and how serious that is, uh, most probably the production will go offline and we will uh, start to see what happened and uh, hopefully roll back to a previous version of the firmware. Any more questions? If the, <coughs> if the environments are connected to the internet, it means that you need to do logging inside the network because if the ISIS environment... Uh, so if uh, the ISIS environments are connected to the internet, uh, how do you get those logs into your uh, SIM, for example? Okay, so they are not connected to the internet, but uh, in uh, many <coughs> practical cases, uh, the business part of the network can, uh, using the VPN and the tunnels, can contact through a DMZ the ACS environment. And this is how it usually uh, happens. We can leverage that. Or we can go a little bit uh, old fashioned and uh, periodically have the logs copied from the uh, from the environment and it just did not see. Depending on what the what the implementation uh, let us do, let us do. And can you uh, your monitor, you can monitor the control workstations? I suppose uh, you can monitor the actual ISIS devices or get some logs from them. They probably have a, a separate types of monitor. Uh, yes, some of them uh, don't have, uh, the majority of them don't have security uh, built in when they were uh, developed. But uh, there are other, uh, other ways to work around that. You can, uh, for example, monitor the traffic that uh, goes from the sensors, for example, to the, uh, to the HMIs. And uh, most of the traffic is not encrypted. It's in the, it is in plain text, and you can look for deviations in the faulty uh, or erratic uh, commands that uh, can be seen. Thank you. Okay, so, thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.